The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second webinar uh, based on the Clarity First book that is my most recent book I've published to date. Uh, welcome, everyone, from across the globe. Uh, good morning, I guess, good evening, and um, it's very late where some of you are and very early where some of you are, so thank you so much for joining. Uh, the first slide that I have up here is just a reminder that we do have a Clarity quiz. It's a free quiz you can take online to help you and your organization assess your baseline and determine where your baseline is. And then, you know, you can put a plan in place to continue to improve the level of clarity you operate with and have a baseline that you can keep in mind as you're working toward some sort of uh, action plan to improve your clarity. So before we get too far into this, I'd love to do just a quick sound check like normal. I'd love to, you to raise your hand if you can hear me loud and clear. It's on your control panel. Awesome. Thank you very much. Also, I wanted to make sure everyone sees that there is a PDF of the materials that are available for download from your control panel. So if you just take a look at, on mine, it's at the bottom of my control panel. I'm not sure if it's exactly the same on yours, but um, go ahead and take a look at that. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So let's get started on today's topics are two of the five Ps, purpose and priorities, which are the first two Ps. Um, these are, for those of you who didn't see the first webinar, uh, it was an overview, and these are, there are five Ps. These are the first two of the five Ps. And several of you, thank, thank you so much for those of you who sent emails and comments on the evaluation form that I forgot to talk about humility during the last webinar. Yes, I did. I never went back to it like I said I was going to. So let's um, take a look at that in just a moment, and then we'll get into purpose and priorities. These are the remaining, uh, this was the first webinar in the upper left here that was uh, a couple weeks ago. And then these are the remaining three webinars for the rest of the summer. If you haven't subscribed, you can subscribe on our webinar page. Also, some of you may be saying, what is this TKMG? I thought it was ksmartin.com. We are actually going to be changing the name to the four letters that actually stand for the Karen Martin Group, or TKMG. And we're going to be doing that um, little by little. We're going to roll it out so we don't confuse Amazon. I'm not Amazon, Google. So we don't confuse Google. Little by little, we'll roll it out. So ksmartin.com will probably always work, but TKMG is a little easier to remember. So you're welcome to use that if you'd like. Okay, so this is again based on Clarity First book. Um, I was really, I don't know if you saw anything on social media that I posted today, but I was thrilled when I woke up this morning to learn that Clarity First is the number one audio book in the business operations research category or something like that, which surprised me that it was in that category and, and taking the number one position, but it was really nice to see that. So um, thank you, those of you who've bought it, you've helped, you've helped put it there. So again, we're going to start with uh, the five Ps this webinar, um, but I am going to go back and go through the humility topic I missed the last time. So we did talk about, for those of you who haven't heard the first webinar, it's available on our webinar page. It's also available on uh, Vimeo, which is, you can look at the channel link on our home page, and it will be on YouTube. We've had a little bit of difficulty on YouTube lately, so we'll get it up on YouTube in the next few days. And I talked a lot about curiosity and, and how necessary curiosity is in order to seek clarity. Because if you're afraid to be curious, you're not likely going to seek the level of clarity you desire. Well, humility is curiosity's counterpart. And humility is something that we're talking about more and more and understanding more and more. It's very important role in lean management and in you know, modern leadership of any sort and in performance improvement of any sort, no matter what methodology you follow. And the reason why humility is so important is because it's the antithesis of thinking you know before you do. And a lot of what we're you know, doing in lean management is helping surface problems so that they become very obvious, removing fear so that the organization can be more um, able to look at true gaps between performance levels that where they like or need to be to look at those and to be able to go forward in solving them without blaming people. So people are rarely the problem. It's almost always process design, systems, work environments, things like that, that cause there to be some sort of a gap in performance. So humility is not thinking you know, but seeking 
some of the facts behind um, a particular allegation before you jump to a conclusion. Humility is also being very respectful of the people who do the work as they are the experts. So if you think about the way we ask questions or the way we make, you know, form conclusions, questions that begin with the words why, what, and how are, you know, have at least on the with the exact words, they have a good feeling of humility. Now, if the tone is off, then it can come off as it's not being humble at all. It can be quite arrogant. Um, but, you know, why do you think that is inviting someone to use their brain and use their experience and their wisdom to help you understand something? What happens when we? That's also a great question, you know, and anything after the word what is a, a good open ended question that invites people to communicate assuming they have a safe space to do that. If it's not psychologically safe for them to answer the question, then of course they're not going to answer the question. So it has to be a safe environment. And the final open-ended question, how, how do we know that? How is a very powerful question when people are just, you know, coming to you and saying, hey, this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem. A non-humble person or a person operating with a level of arrogance is likely going to take whatever that person says and just run with it. And that's arrogance. What humility allow or asks us to do and requires us to do is to ask for facts before we go running off and taking action and making decisions and things like that. It's it's just being very respectful of facts. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that we're not the experts. So those are the three questions that, or, or the three words that need to start questions that are open-ended and invite good understanding. Now, in terms of statements, I'm only giving you, you know, six examples. There's many, many more. But in terms of statements, one of the statements that's very powerful, we ask a whole lot when we're working with clients is, tell me more about that. You know, when someone makes a statement, you want to invite them to elaborate and fill in some of the gaps that oftentimes there's a lot of nuance in what people are talking about. And you want to be able to tease out, you know, what's relevant from what's not relevant and 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 actually what's truth and not truth based in fact. So tell me more about that is often a very good statement to a request to make um, that's laced in humility. Also, I don't know, but I'll find out. You know, I don't know is such a powerful statement. It's something that a lot of us get drummed out of us by well-meaning teacher, well, maybe not well-meaning <laughs> teachers, parents, um, bosses. You know, sometimes, you know, saying I don't know is viewed as an incredible sign of weakness. It actually isn't. You know, you have to kind of forget that those people think that because they're not right. Um, I don't know is an incredibly humble and a respectful way to engage with someone in communication and conversation and to you know, solve problems deeply. And then another statement we use a lot, I'm curious to learn. And, and so I'm curious to learn about blah, blah, blah. I'm curious to learn what you mean by that. I'm curious to learn why you think that is happening. I'm curious to learn is a very powerful humility-laced comment and question. So those are just a few of many examples that are out there. Um, tone matters. Body language matters. Pointing is a big no-no. Big, big, big no-no. Don't point. Um, and, and just also turn your body so that you're facing the person you're communicating with instead of having your shoulder point toward them. That also has a tremendous feeling of humility. And you'll get more information the more humble you are. So that's a little bit about humility. I'll, I'll lace it throughout all of these webinars so that we can um, understand its importance. Okay, so now let's dive into purpose. That's the first of the two P's for today. And it's one that, as I've been you know, researching the book and then writing the book, and now that I'm talking about the book and conducting workshops, it's, it's interesting how many people undervalue purpose and believe that it's much simpler than it is. And so purpose seems like it's just a no-brainer. You know, what's your purpose? Well, our purpose is to make money or our purpose is to make, you know, this widget or our purpose is to deliver health care. None of those are true. From my viewpoint, none of those are true. So I'm going to give you a little more insight into what purpose is and why it matters. 
purpose. So the, the person that really got me going down this whole purpose path was Simon Sinek. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, but uh, Start With Why was his New York Times bestseller, actually international bestseller. And I found that book so powerful. And, you know, if you haven't seen his classic TED Talk, just look up, you know, on YouTube, just do TED Talk Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K, and you'll get it. It's, it's one of the most watched, I think it's the most watched TED Talk. Um, anyway, he really got me thinking about this whole why thing many, many years ago. And then I started thinking about the lean movement and how the lean movement really didn't do a good job in the beginning of talking about why other than the five whys and the, you know, in problem solving at a micro level or a tactical level that, you know, of course, why, 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 very powerful. But this notion of getting to the core of what the essence of an organization is there to do that was something that was very silent in the lean movement for quite some time. But getting to why you do what you do and getting clarity around that and communicating it in everything an organization does is incredibly powerful. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, well, I'm not the CEO, I don't have any ability to control this or affect this. Well, you know, you could try to get some communication up the ladder to your leadership team and, and you know, express your interest in seeing why and, and purpose become a more um, front and center aspect of organizational conversation and decisions and things like that. Or you could, or and or, I guess I should say, you could also define purpose of your work team or your department or your division. You know, purpose is important anywhere in the organization. And oh, by the way, your individual purpose of what you're here to accomplish in life, that's also important. But we'll talk about that when we get to Clarity and You. Uh, it's the last webinar in the series. So why you do what you do is very important. Now, why you do what you do people often think they know the answer for very, very quickly. And I'm going to suggest that most people don't know very quickly. So why does why matter? The first thing is the employees of an organization, the team members, the associates, the partners, you know, whatever you refer to them as, those are the people that why matters the most to. And it's because those are the people who you want to attract and retain the you know, top performers in order for the organization to excel. And people want to be connected to a higher purpose. Most people, except for the rare, 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 you know, sociopaths will say, really need connection. I mean, it's if you study Maslow's hierarchy of needs and all of the psychological models that have come after that, the one common thing is that everyone needs a connection. It's a human need that can't be denied. And if it is denied, then you get improper human behavior. So when we see behavioral patterns and just start blaming the person, oftentimes the person's only behaving based on the environment that they're in. And if the environment becomes a much clearer environment around person, purpose, then the person has something to connect to. They're more likely to get deeply engaged. You know, lack of connection with purpose, I believe, is one of the reasons why the Gallup Q12 polls have not changed much in decades in terms of how engaged employees are. So why matters a lot? Because individuals crave being connected to a higher good. Most people walk into work in the morning wanting to serve and do well. Now, the other thing is, is that once you get within the organization, people crave a connection with each other. Now, that's not 100% true. You know, you have introverts that prefer sometimes working alone, and you have you know, people in certain um, career paths that they've chosen sometimes are a little more um, not, you know, groupy oriented. I actually am not a groupie. You know, I, I am, you know, as much as I'm an extrovert in talking and being with clients and speaking and all these things, I actually crave alone time. And I'm not a big, you know, follow the pack kind of gal. And so I'm not necessarily craving the degree of connection that some do, but everyone craves it to some level. Everyone. We want to know we matter. We want to know we're loved. We want to know we're respected. Everyone needs that. And so when organizations focus purely on product, and they don't get to the why, they miss this wonderful way to engage people. And you as a leader of a small work team or a big department or a division or a business unit or if there's any CEOs or presidents on the webinar, you know, the whole organization, 
you have a very important role to play in helping people under your you know, purview that you have oversight for feel connected to a clearly defined purpose. That's what captures people's hearts. Now, this isn't just me saying purpose matters. This isn't just Simon saying purpose matters. You know, there are a lot of people starting to understand, a lot of researchers understanding how important purpose was. So timing is everything. July to August this year, HBR's um, magazine, the very cover story is when work has meaning, meaning how to turn purpose into performance. So as I was studying organizations, writing the book, I started finding over and over and over how organizations that had a strong purpose seemed to also have very good performance. And organizations that had poor performance very often seemed to lack a very strong understanding of their purpose and strongly communicating that. Now, is it cause and effect for sure? No, I'm not a researcher and I didn't do, you know, academic research to determine that. However, there were patterns I noticed that I thought were worth noting. And the two authors of this article, When Work Has Meaning, said two things that I totally agree with. One is you don't invent a purpose, it's already there. And one of the things I suggest to clients is go back to the originators of the company. You know, if they're no longer alive, go to something in writing. Find why they formed that organization. Why? That often gives you a very, very strong um, insight into what the purpose is. If anyone organizes a company purely to make profit, it usually doesn't survive decades and, and centuries. And so, you know, you don't usually find that to be the core driver. It's usually some other reason. And the other thing that these authors said is that most companies experience mission drift. And I love that term. It's not something that I had heard before. I just love that term, mission drift, because especially in rapidly growing companies, it is really easy to start straying from what your core reason for being is your decisions can change, the priorities can change, the actions you take can change, the way you deal with customers can change, the deal you the way you work with employees or team members may change. And so getting back to purpose or you know mining for that purpose is very important if you want to have clarity as an organization and clarity drives performance. Now, I really agree with these two things. There's one thing in the article I actually don't agree with at all. And it's that they had um, less of a focus on purpose around a product and more of a focus around purpose of, you know, engaging with employees. I think employee engagement is huge. It's, it's very, very important. But when I talk about purpose, I'm talking about purpose of, around a product. So in Clarity First, the way I you know, kind of look at this hierarchy of superficial to deep, deep, deep knowledge and clarity around an organization, the easy question to answer that almost everyone can answer is, what do you do? Certainly all executives can answer it. Mid-level managers and directors can usually answer it. The front lines may not know the full range of goods or services, goods and or services that the organization provides, but they may only know the ones that they're familiar with and, and they're working with. But most people can answer the question when their you know, aunt comes for Christmas or they're um, in the grocery store and they run into their neighbor or you know, whatever it might be, they can answer the question, what's your company do? What's your organization do? The harder question to answer is, what do you really do? So if we think in terms of lean management, what we are really doing, all businesses, all organizations, not, profit, not for profits, for profits, are there to solve a problem of some sort. They're there to help close a gap of some sort. And you're getting closer to purpose when you get very, very clear on which gap or gaps is your organization attempting to close. So what problem do you, does your product solve becomes a very important question to noodle on. And then if you're at a department level or a little, even a little tiny work team level, what do you do becomes it's easy. What do you really do? What problem is your work team solving for the rest of the organization? Or if your customer facing a customer? Now, the harder question is level three. Why do you do it? That's where we get into what is your purpose? Why do you solve that problem over another problem? What's really behind what you do? 
So you can take a look at, there's a lot more, you know, in the book around these three questions, but those are the three questions that you have to think about. Now, one thing that I'll just kind of jump ahead for a moment, and I'm going to go back. One thing to consider is that, you know, in business for decades now, we've had this phobia for talking about anything that smacks of emotion or squishy or, you know, it's just always, um, you know, I, I always say, you know, we've taken the humanity out of the workplace. And thankfully, the millennials are actually one of the most important driving factors in bringing humanity back to work. It's no coincidence, I don't believe, that we're starting to talk more about joyful workplaces and, you know, human, human, um, human oriented workplaces and all of those things that are now, you know, front and center in a lot of business literature is we're realizing, uh huh. Well, what do you know? People are emotional beings and emotional beings don't leave their emotions at the door when they walk into the workplace. So purpose is emotional, but it's not just the workers and the, you know, the employees and team members, it's customers. So if you think about purpose related to a good or a service that you provide, the purpose for that good or service is typically meeting some emotional need of a person. Purpose is meeting some emotional need or needs of a person, of the customer, even internally. So hang on, let me explain more. So first of all, let's take an example of manufacturing a product that's seemingly bland, tires. So what do we do? We make tires, okay? That's level one. Level two, what problem does your tire solve? Now, you know, if it's good quality tire, which is what we're trying to create, then the tire won't get flat. And that's, that's why we exist. We exist to make tires. No, wait a minute. We exist to make good tires so that people don't have flat tires. If you go a little bit deeper, and think about the customer of the tire and what the cut, what that tire is actually doing for someone, the purpose of that product, you will find that what it's doing is in the case of a high quality tire, it's giving people confidence. It's having them not fret every time they get behind the wheel of the car that they're going to get a flat tire. It's helping them feel good about how their car handles. You know, it's, it, there's, there's emotion around a good tire. If you get tires and you, maybe you get one tire twice and they seem to wear out really fast, you're not going to have confidence around that brand because it doesn't make you feel good. At the end of the day, people want to feel good and confidence and feeling safe and all those kinds of things are huge in understanding the purpose for why you exist. So I'll give you an example related to this. It's also like a, techno a technical physical product. Um, I was working with a client for a while that has a product. It, um, they have cameras that they put into vehicles in fleets and things like that that track driver behavior. And when I asked a bunch of team members, including managers in the organization, what their purpose is, they said, you know, our purpose is we make cameras. And, you know, we kind of dug, dug a little bit deeper. I said, well, what problem does it solve? Oh, okay. Oh, uh, it solves the problem of our people, you know, the drivers um, and the fleets not knowing how their people are driving. So their insurance rates can go up and, you know, they can have accidents and this and that. And, they, you know, they were talking a lot about financial reasons for the problem that solves. And then when we dug a little bit deeper, it's like, well, why solve that problem only after, oh, over any other problem? Finally, this one manager came in one day wearing a t-shirt and he said, we save lives. The whole point of tracking driver behavior is ultimately to save lives because accidents hurt people and accidents then cause insurance to go up. So there's the financial link, but it's not the sole reason for doing this. The sole reason is to save lives. You see as an employee of this organization, how suddenly everything shifts when you're going in every day to work and all of a sudden you're there to help save lives. It is a big deal. Here you thought you were just manu manufacturing a camera. And oh, by the way, one more quick note about this is that the lack of clarity around product is huge. It turns out that's actually not the product that these that this company produces. They have them made and they get them in and they install them. 
their actual product is software. Their intellectual property is software that these, you know, complex algorithms. And so, you know, it just, you know, you may think that this is super easy. Like, oh, of course we know our purpose. I, I would, I would argue that you, a lot of people in your company probably don't really know your purpose and it's worth having a conversation around. I'm going to give you one more example. So greeting cards. This happens to be a lovely uh, store in the Netherlands. So greeting cards, I worked with a greeting card manufacturer and when I said, hey, you know, what's your purpose? Like, oh, we make greeting cards. And we dug a little bit deeper. Like, well, what, what do you, you know, really do? Well, you know, we give people, you know, a means to meet an obligation. I was like, all right. You know, that's that's OK. They meet an obligation to have a birthday card with the present. That's expected. You have a card with the present. That's what they do. But when we kept talking, what we really got into it for the why, the why is to help people express an emotion. Maybe they feel obligated, but more commonly, it's an emotion that they may not feel comfortable articulating verbally. So even a simple I love you. Some people don't feel comfortable saying those words, I love you, for all kinds of reasons. They can say it in a card and in writing. Or, I'm really happy for you. Sometimes people have a hard time just being that direct and saying that, but you can say it in a card. Or, I feel really bad in the case of this one. You know, there's some kind of sympathy here or empathy here. You know, there's all kinds of reasons. Congratulations. Just expressing joy and being thrilled that someone's a friend. All the reasons that we send greeting cards, it's the emotion behind it that really matters. And when you suddenly get a whole organization focused not just on producing pretty cards with bows and sound, but you have people focused on helping people express an emotion and helping them feel confident about that, that's a whole different level. So I am just really high on the whole purpose thing. And I don't, I do think that purpose is tied to product. I do. Now, let me just make one more note about profit. So I talk about this quite at length in the book. I have a whole sidebar on profit um, because I've heard it. I've heard it a lot when we start interviewing prospective clients like, you know, why are you in business? Ah, to make money. You know what? Money is an outcome. Money is not the reason. It's never been the reason. It will never be the reason. Money is an outcome. Purpose is not, your purpose is not to make a profit. It's a result of operating with clear purpose. Now, are you going to make profit for sure if you just have clear purpose? Well, heck no. You have to have a high quality product, you know, good or service that you're providing. It needs to be priced appropriately that the market will want to buy it. You know, it needs to have a good track record so it's not breaking down or it's not faulty or, you know, in the case of healthcare, you're not killing people. You know, there's, there's all that. So it's not just having a clear purpose, but organizations with a clear purpose happen to seemingly outperform other organizations. So it is a, it's an important deal. All right, so that's it about purpose. Now let's talk about priorities. So those of you that have read The Outstanding Organization, I talked a little bit about strategy, strategy deployment and my view that there's a piece missing from the typical strategy deployment path for organizations that go into it. I go into it a little more deeply in Clarity First, and I want to give you like a, a summary of, of both of those takes um, here in this webinar. So priorities are important, and most organizations have a really difficult time with priorities. They either have too many, or they have too many going on at once, or they don't have the right people deployed, or there's a number of, of things that happen that make work tough to execute. And it's really important to have strong prioritization and good muscle around prioritization in order to accomplish the things that need to be done in order to deploy a strategy. So let's talk about this whole thing, strategy deployment. Over here in the right-hand corner, you'll see also known as Hoshin Conry and Hoshin Planning, which is the plan part of it. Hoshin Conry is the whole planning, execution, managing the plan. It's the whole cycle of of um, deploying a strategy. So strategy deployment is a clear focus, discipline, and deeply engaging approach to achieve measurable business goals. So these are measurable goals that enable the organization to realize its strategy and stay true to its purpose. So it's very helpful to have a clear purpose before you get too far down the path of, of trying strategy deployment and experimenting with strategy deployment. 
Now, why do you even want to do, why, why even think about strategy deployment? Well, first of all, to align everyone in the organization. So, you know, we find in so many organizations, there's, you know, one area thinks that this is the priority because it's important to them. And another part of the organization, this is the priority because it's important to them. What if they need the same resources? That's just not, that's just a recipe for chaos. And so you want to get alignment and you want to get everyone agreeing holistically in the organization's priorities. And it's not easy getting there, but when you get there, it is incredibly powerful. The next thing is to galvanize and unify those limited resources so that they're take the work that they're doing outside of the normal work of, you know, of just serving customers, the extra effort that they have to do need to be focused in a way to achieve those specific business objectives. And they're typically for one fiscal year. They're typically a full year and it's typically a fiscal year. You can start and should start as soon as possible. So you can start mid year, but typically you link your budget to the priorities. And so that's why they're typically lined up with a fiscal year. You want to develop and deeply engage the workforce and create commitment to a common direction. So a lot of times when I hear people say, ah, we have such a problem with accountability. Well, usually it's not accountability, it's commitment. And usually it's not because of the person, it's because it's not clear what the whole organization is committed to. And there's too much going on at once and there's no clear owner and I could go on and on and on. So again, we see it's not the people, it's the systems and the processes that make it difficult for people to achieve what, peop what leadership would like them to achieve. The next thing is to get faster, better, and longer lasting results. So the more you have what I call organizational ADD, attention deficit disorder, the more organizational ADD you've got, the harder it's going to be to achieve results and the more shorter lived they'll be because you don't have teeth in place for them to sustain. So you want to be able to have this methodical, disciplined approach toward defining what needs to be done and then doing it in that and when you do it, then you're able to get those deep results. And then finally, strategy, strategy deployment done well maximizes everyone's productivity and reduces the effects of task switching. So I'd like you all to do something. I'm going to do an experiment here. And you, these, these are always scary. Like, is it going to work or is it going to be a miserable failure? But we're going to find out. We're going to experiment. We're going to do a PDC, P PDSA cycle. I'd like you to get a smartphone handy and find your stopwatch. I'll do the same so I can see how much time you need. Get our stopwatches together. All right, I'm ready. All right, and then um, I also would like you to follow my instructions very clearly when I get to the next slide, okay? So, hang on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead. Hang on, hang on, hang on. All right, we're gonna have two tasks. And with the first task, I'd like you to, when I, when I say go, you're going to write the numbers 1 through 16. <coughs> Excuse me. Your second task is going to be to write the sentence, focus is essential. And what you're going to do for the first round, I want to show you what task switching is like and how it affects performance. We're going to task switch, meaning that you're going to go task 1, task 2. Task one, task two, task one, task two. So on the lines, on a piece of paper, you can write this on a whiteboard if you'd like, whatever you'd like, wherever you're sitting. You're going to basically write the, the sentence up here or the numbers down here. You can switch them if you'd like. It doesn't matter. But go one by one, one by one. So F102, C3, or 1F20, however your brain works, it doesn't matter. Just alternate between those and time yourself. So I'll say on your mark, get set, go, um, but make sure you look at the time when you're done. All right, on your mark, get set, go. Probably about halfway done. A few more seconds. All 
All right, I'm going to stop here. If you're still going, keep going and note the time when you're done. So, you know, most of you are probably, well, actually, go ahead and uh, uh, write in your comment area, you know, what, what your numbers were or in the question area. What, let's see what some of your numbers were. How many seconds? Okay, 33. 27.66. Wow, that's a, that's very that's very exact. 40, 44, 26, 37, 33, 48, 39. Okay, so they're kind of hovering around the 40. Oh wow, there's someone super fast. 16. You go, Diana. Um, <laughs> anyway, so they're kind of in the 30 to 40 range. So um, now what we're going to do is we're going to do the exact same work, but instead of introducing task switching, we're going to complete one task at a time and then start the second one. So what you're going to do is first write all the numbers and then write the sentence. Or if you feel inclined, you can first write the sentence completely and then write the numbers 1 through 16. Either way, you're going to get to the same end. So I'm going to say on your mark, get set, go again. And let's do it now with no task switching. All numbers and then all letters or all letters, a sentence, and then all numbers. Okay? On your mark, get set, go. When you're done, go ahead and start putting your numbers in. In the, okay. 14, 13, 15, 12, 13, 16, 14, 15, 14, 18, 17, etc. So, you know, in half is kind of a directional, a directional way. And that was because of what? Why was it so much faster? Because you weren't having to stop and think as you were switching back and forth from tasks. And this is, you know, you may think this is a silly little exercise, but imagine what happens in the real world when the tasks are very complex. So the original research on this was done by David Meyer at the University of Michigan when he studied engineering engineers and looked at the amount of time it took them to ramp back up. So for those of you in manufacturing, this is really very much like changeover reduction, setup reduction is, you know, finding a way so that there's not that same amount of mental setup between tasks. So you get do fewer things at once, get them done and then move on to the next task. When you do that, look at your results. You're, you would be able to get twice as much, if not three times as much, done in the same amount of time if you just did one thing at a time. I encourage you to use this with your teams, share it with leaders. It's, it's powerful and it's really hard in this world that we've gotten ourselves so accustomed to, you know, this what we call multitasking, which actually you can't multitask to cognitive tasks. It's impossible. It's been proven over and over and over. And so what you can do is eat while you're watching TV, for example, um, but you can't watch a ticker tape on the bottom of a TV, retain what it's, what it's telling you, what you're reading, and listen to the commentator and retain what the commentator is saying. So if you don't believe me, turn on a sports channel or a news channel or uh, you know, something else and try it. And I, I wish they would just remove ticker tapes or mute the commentators, one or the other, because we can't do both. So, <coughs> so strategy deployment is all about starting to get rid of that need to task switch or switch tasks. So what we want to do is I believe, and this is one thing that's very new, not new but not to me anymore, but it's new to the strategy deployment world, it's not usually done, is I think most organizations have to go through a bit of a cleanup period before they can actually be effective doing strategy deployment. And so the cleanup period is to get leaders to gather around, go talk to all the people that uh, they oversee, and gather five different lists with five different categories. So all active projects and initiatives. So let me be clear about this. So I define this as, quote, extra work or extra effort. These are projects, initiatives, priorities that are over and above the course of daily delivery of value to customers. So these are, require extra resources, extra effort. IT projects count. Any kind of product development counts, any kind of operational improvement counts, any kind of you know big initiatives to move into a new market counts. 
those are all extra effort projects, initiatives, or priorities. So make a list of all the active ones across the organization, or if you're doing this just for your little work area, in your work area. Then make a list of all the stalled projects and initiatives and priorities that were started, and then for whatever reason, no judgment, they've been stopped. And, and they probably will be picked up at some point. All planned projects, initiatives, and priorities. So these are all that are in queue, waiting to be started. All desired projects and initiatives. This one's an interesting one. What happens when you start asking the questions to get the active stalled and planned is people will say, hey, why aren't we doing this? Hey, why aren't we doing that? And then you'll get this new list of projects that aren't officially in queue yet, but want to be in queue. And then the 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 dark the dark box is the stealth or rogue projects that and initiatives that people are doing, but they're really not official, but they're being done. So we had a client where there was a uh, a leader that really wanted to work on a key operational change and it had been voted down three times from the leadership team because there wasn't enough bandwidth in the organization to get it done well with every other priority they had and when we went and did this homework we found out he was doing it anyway he just was doing it under the table and no one knew about it but he was occupying resources and asking them to help him on this project even though it wasn't official so there will be those and you have to mine pretty deeply to find them when organizations of any size do this it is not unusual to get lists with 400 or more projects on it and in the book i talk about the cio of target and what happened when he joined the, the organization, he was over the you know, technology area, chief information officer, and what he found out and what he said, okay, no, we're not going to do this. So he did a version of strategy deployment. He may not call it that, but that's what he did. Um, now, once you get the list, then what you do is you have to gather the right people in the room. So if you're at a department level, you know, get your full department. If you're at the executive level and working at an organization-wide level, you get the executive team. And you categorize them. So you have what's usually the easiest to get done first is the must-dos, ideally based on some clear criteria. And then the eliminates are also usually pretty easy to get them where people say, oh, why are we doing that? We don't need to do that anymore. Conditions have changed. And then the delays become a little less clear, but they, they're not, not too hard to get. And then everything else remains in a maybe pile. And then once you get those three categories done, then you disposition all the maybes and you put them into the must do delay or eliminate. So the delay means that you're using the term not yet. So there's now, not yet, and never is the eliminate. Now, not yet, never. And organizations, leaders in particular, the higher they are, the harder this is, is to say not yet or no. Um, so this takes, you know, again, this is changing behavior. It's changing mindset. It takes a lot to get an organization to develop this kind of, of habit. So, But this is what you do to start so that you can create the bandwidth to do what you really need to do for strategy deployment. That's the action plan that you create is what the must-dos. Now, I'm going to go back for a moment before I go forward for the action plan. I decided it made sense to do that, um, that uh, timing exercise there at the very beginning. So the problem with this whole strategy deployment area is it requires you to have a very clear strategy to deploy. So most organizations say they have a strategy, and in some cases, it's a very good strategy and it's very clear. In many cases, it's not what we consider to be a strategy and or it's very unclear. So a strategy isn't be the best. <laughs> Everyone wants to be the best. That is not a strategy. Strategy isn't even let's grow market share by 25 percent. Strategy requires you to get a little more into the how at a high level, but a little more into the how on you know, how you're going to execute a play. So think of football or soccer or any game of strategy that's heavy strategy, the sports. I mean, this is exactly what they do. They know where they want to go. In football case, U.S. football, they want to get a touchdown. They know where they're at, so they have their baseline. But what they don't know necessarily is how they're going to get there until they create a strategy. And so they're creating a strategy for how they're going to get there at a high level. And then they have to execute it. And that's where tactics come in. 
So you have to have a strategy to deploy, and I'm not going to get a lot into this because there's a wonderful resource out there, and this is to date, this is still the best book I've ever read on strategy. When um, and A.G. Laffley was the former CEO of Procter and Gamble, and Roger Martin is a phenomenal professor at uh, the Toronto Rotman School of Management. The question they ask is, where do you want to play? Where does your department want to play? Where does your division want to play? Where does your organization want to play? In what field? Where do you want to be in 10 years? Describe it. What do you want to be doing? What do you want to be? How do you want to help? Those are the questions that you ask and get very clear on it. So then once you get clear on that, there's an, a very large cycle of PDSA problem solving that goes because you will have identified your gap. You will have identified your target. And that's classic problem solving. How are we going to get there? And then within the strategy deployment plan, as you start executing, then you'll have a little, you know, a micro PDSA cycle. And then when you get to the tactical level, you'll have another micro, even more micro PDSA cycle. So strategy deployment is a problem solving methodology at the highest levels. And you have like a nested dolls situation. So the gap that you identify is the difference between where you are and where you'd like, or in the case of some urgent issues, where you really need to be. That's your gap, and that's what, PD, that's what strategy deployment aims to close. Now, how do you close it? Well, first of all, you have to know your gap, and you have to know how you're going to measure success. So you know, I talk about level three, two, and one scorecards and visual management in Clarity First. This is just one, the highest level of it. And if you'll notice, this scorecard has a very nice blend of different metrics. And you notice that the financial metrics are not the ones listed on the top. In fact, it's non-financial metrics. It's customer-facing metrics that are at the top. Then there are financial metrics, but they're, they're the second thing you see. And so having a level three scorecard at the organization level is important. And then each of the areas can do what they need to do. And this is part of creating that plan in order to help fulfill these goals that are set. Again, it's usually a fiscal year. The other thing that's important to note is that when you get clear about your purpose and you're creating your strategy, the KPIs, you can have actually two levels of KPIs or two types within the organization. You can have KPIs that show how you're executing your strategy at a more innovative level. How are you innovating to, to create or to reach your strategy, whatever your goals are? And then once you get your priorities set in a strategy deployment plan, then you have KPIs to show you know, how you're doing with those priorities. So it depends on the organization, on you know, how, you, how you work KPIs. There's no cookie cutter approach to this, but the most important thing is that you do need to have um, KPIs that kind of go down through the organization in order to create alignment. So the strategy deployment process, when I talked about um, the, the, um, the homework and getting those lists, that's this extra effort that's on phase two. So phase one is assuming that you have a clear purpose, a clear strategy, and clear KPIs. Phase two is you do that homework, and you narrow and prioritize, and then we'll talk in a moment about playing catch ball, and then you finalize the plan. Phase three, you make that plan very, very visual, and you check the plan very frequently to make sure that everyone's on course. You adjust as needed. And then phase four is as you're executing, you're getting results. You're closing those gaps that have been identified. Getting clarity around this is one of the most powerful things any organization can do. So let's move ahead. Here's what the plan looks like. This is one version. I mean, we, we don't have a template that we use. Every plan is slightly different for every client, depending on who they are and what they need. And what I mean by that is sometimes we include this level of effort. We're increasingly including this level of effort area where you have these line items that show what they're going to be achieving. You have a bit of a Gantt chart on when they're going to start and complete those tasks. And then you have this level of effort grid that you fill in based on whether someone's going to have just minor involvement, medium involvement, or significant involvement, and we define it based on how many hours of effort it'll take, or no involvement is blank, so that you can glance at this. It's a nice visual to make sure you don't have Bob 
<laughs> Bob happened to be the CEO in this case. You don't want Bob to have all threes. You also don't want any functional area to have all threes. You also want to make sure that each owner doesn't have, you know, too many items. That you, you know, like Josh has a whole bunch here, and that that was a problem that we actually talked about. Whereas, you know, Howard didn't. He wasn't um, really touching any department with some of his. Plan. So there, this is just a nice visual to make sure it's balanced and you don't put too much burden in any one area of the organization and that all areas of the organization are actually involved. Catchball is the way that you take a draft and it is a draft of a high level plan and then spread it throughout the organization to get true consensus and gaining that con that consensus leads to commitment once you get commitment it's much harder for people to decide they want to go off and do their own thing and so we recommend catchball being done only with one level the first year sometimes two levels and then you bring it down another level in year two and then another level in year three and what what this catchball process is, it's, it's literally leaders saying to the next level down in the organization, here's what we think. What do you think? What are you experiencing? What do you think our priorities should be? And listening very, very well and possibly, probably adjusting the plan based on the feedback. So this is not the 80s style cascading goals. Actually, it's probably still being done a lot of places. It's not just cascading goals. It's a dialogue, and it's really understanding what the true needs of the organization are through the eyes of all the people in the organization. And the closer you get to the front lines, the more they know truly what the customer is experiencing. And so, you know, executives have a hard time starting to think about the front lines playing a role in setting their strategic direction, not the strategic direction, I'm sorry, the plan for achieving the strategic direction. But that's the way it needs to go. That's the way that it's the most powerful. So that's what Catchball is. So uh, the key features are you're aligning, you're focusing. You're gaining consensus. You're getting disciplined execution through um, progress checks and problem solving. So the plan is reviewed on a very regular basis. You're getting great clarity of that status through visual management. So no one has to say, hey, where are we on that? I don't know what's going on. This is all visual. And you get the certainty of results because you're measuring on an ongoing basis and, and you're sure that it's actually working versus it might not be. And then finally, you're building capabilities across the organization and you're getting sustainability of results, both of them, because you're building this robust problem solving muscle across the whole organization. So it's a very, very powerful approach to use. Now, I just wanted to share something with you. This is actually um, our most recent template that we've used for a recent client. And I've changed up a couple things I wanted to point out. So we are now making sure that we as best as a client can frame what the initiative is going to be or the priority as a problem to be solved, meaning that there's a defined gap from two metrics. We want to go from here to there, and then there's an area to take notes. This has been pretty powerful. As we've gotten organizations clearer and clearer on how they're going to measure success, it's gotten harder. But it's also the plan, the resulting plan is much more robust. So instead of an organization saying, we're going to do this, then you actually frame it as a problem. And it's, um, it's easier to get people to align with it. And it's a much more powerful way to work. So we have a few more minutes for questions. And I see a whole bunch of questions that have come in. Um, so I want to spend enough time on those. And we do have a hard stop at 1 PM Central. So um, just you know, take a look at Clarity first if you haven't. Um, it goes into so much more detail than I can in a webinar. And um, I'm going to just roll out and go into some questions. All right. And, and by the way, all the webinars are recorded, and all of them are on our webinar site, YouTube and Vimeo. So um, if you anyone missed it, feel free to have them go ahead and check our site. So I see actually a bunch of question marks where people have um, – Oh, no, these are question marks because you've written questions. Let me see if there's any hands that are raised. Um, no, I think we're good. Okay, so let me just go to the questions. 
Um, can we combine it? Can we combine Toyota Kata with Clarity first? Oh, sure. Yes. 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 So any problem-solving methodology, you know, re can benefit from Clarity. And the Clarity methods that I talk about are not. I don't think they're in conflict. I mean, someone that thinks that they may uh, conflict maybe should let me know because I I don't think any of these conflict with any of the methodologies. You know, it could be. An organization that uses Ford's 8D method, it could be DMAIC. Uh, you know, we prefer PDSA for many reasons that I talked about in Clarity, no, actually in uh, the Outstanding Organization. But yeah, you can absolutely combine. All right, next question. So go ahead and write your questions in. We have some time. Have you found that Catchball can actually serve as data to help leaders know if their strategy is working? That is, feedback is PDSA metadata. Ooh, good question. Well, yes, if. <laughs> so when we work with organizations the first year, I'll just be frank, usually the leadership teams don't have a real strong humility muscle built yet. And catchball is one of the methods that can help them build that because, you know, we're there usually in these conversations, or at least in some of them, to see how a leader responds to someone's ideas that are different from what is in the plan. So we're there to coach them and, and catch them on thinking they know and thinking their ideas are better and all those things that make leaders and, and all the way down the front lines actually connect in a much deeper level, leaders' jobs will always be to set strategy. So that's not something the front lines really get to weigh in on. It's the deployment of that strategy that the front lines can get clear on. Now, you, know, you can do catch ball with the strategy itself, but we're talking about deploying a strategy that leaders and boards have typically set. And so there's less, there's less catch ball in that process. This is now how are we going to accomplish this? Um, so yes, I, I I think it does actually serve. I've seen I've been witness to it actually serving as data, um, but it does require we do a pretty healthy or a pretty heavy lift on helping them see some of the psychological ways that they operate that either help them or get them in the way or you know keep them from being able to do their work well as leaders. So yeah, I think the answer is yes. Okay. What tool do you recommend for tracking multiple projects task level to improve clarity? So good question. We actually um, don't recommend software. Uh, if anything, we just say, you know, Excel actually has a pretty robust way of creating the visual that you need. Now, tracking workflow related tracking, that's a whole different ballgame. But at a glance, so the strategy deployment plan is typically, you know, I'd say for a 1,000 person organization, 1,000 employees or team members, you know, I'd say that there's usually 25 at the most, and they have to be really different kinds of priorities on the plan. And then each one of those line items typically, so let me go back for a second. Each one of these line items typically requires there to be a separate project plan with its own micro Gantt chart and break, a breakdown of all the different stages of work. So, you know, very often we have our clients just do it on Excel, um, but, you know, there's plenty of good project management software out there. We just we just like to keep it simple. Um, workflow needs robust software. I'm not sure that project tracking always does. So um, that's just a bias. So I hope that helps. Have you used Scrum for hardware manufacturing? Any advice? Um, so at, at the risk of annoying anybody who is a Scrum person or an Agile person or a DevOps person or whatever, they all have elements of lean. So no, we don't go out there and, and teach Scrum to clients. We teach lean. And Scrum has some very wonderful elements. When it's done well, it tends to work really well. It's also got some limitations, just like everything has limitations. Um, you know, DevOps, D-E-V-O-P-S, DevOps, is closer and closer to lean thinking and lean doing. Um, agile is kind of in the middle. And, you know, Scrum is often really agile. You know, Scrum Master tends to be... It, you know, organizations have gotten these, all these different things have kind of meshed together. So um, I don't have any advice for using it. Um, okay, next question. Give any thought to developing a pattern language for clarity. You are already mostly there. A 
pattern language. I do tell, Jeffrey. I don't know what that is. Given any thought to developing a pattern language for clarity? So I'm going to give Jeffrey a moment. We have one minute left. If anyone has any more questions, feel free to um, put them in um, while we're waiting for Jeffrey. Hopefully he's still on. Yes, he's still on. So we're waiting for Jeffrey to help us know what pattern language is. Jeffrey, do you hear me? <laughs> I don't know if you're still there or not. So, um, oh, pattern language is a way to reproduce competence. Oh, I need to Google it, I think. I, I will be Googling this afternoon. I, I don't know what this is. To re I wa definitely want to reproduce competence, so we'll find out. You're already mostly there. Um, so, Jeffrey, send me an email. I want to learn more, and I'll Google, okay? Oh, Christopher Alexander is the author of the original work. Okay, Christopher Alexander is the author of the original work. All right, I will look into it. All right, last thing. Oh, wow, I can't answer this. Why did Lean Six Sigma not help GE? <laughs> um, there are a lot of reasons why GE had its problems, and Lean Six Sigma was only one of them. Let's just say that. Um, and it was the way it was deployed, and there were leadership gaps, and there were philosophical gaps and, you know, there were Jack Welch had strengths, Jack Welch had weaknesses, there's all these things. Um, so I'm sorry, it's now one o'clock, I really do need to run. Um, Joyce, I see you just dropped a question. Drop in an email to me, please, and I'll go ahead and, um, and, and answer you. Sam, same with you. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope to see you on the next webinar, and in the meantime, just play around with this. Practice with it. Experiment with it, even in your own work areas. And for sure, stop multitasking and believing you can multitask and still be successful. You can't. You got to stop that. Limit your switch tasking, okay? Or task switching. Take care, everyone. Have a good day or evening, wherever you are. Bye-bye.